welcome to this past Sunday's message from Stone Edge Church. We are praying that it will be life transforming from wherever you are watching today. Join us now as we get into the message together. Let's pray and I'm going to hop into my sermon today. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for a church family that really does want to dig into the scriptures. Thank you for a family that, that enjoys time when we, when we get deep into the word of God. And so today, Lord, is one of those days. We're gonna be walking a little deeper into one of the stories from David's life. And I pray, uh, Father, in this moment, that you would really open our ears and open our hearts to everything that you want us to know and learn, especially as it relates to us becoming more like you, Jesus. Thank you for the day. I pray your anointing over all of us, our ears and our hearts and my words. It's in your beautiful name I pray, amen. Well, if you've been with us over the summer, you've known that I personally, the sermons that I've been preaching have been all about David. We started off on the first part of the summer, we talked about David the warrior, the classic story of David and Goliath. And then we moved into David the wounded. And then we talked about David the waiting king. And then we talked about David the wise leader. David most certainly is one of the most iconic people in the Bible. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself and maybe the Apostle Paul, he's one of the most well-known guys in the Bible. And he's certainly known for some of the amazing things uh, that he did do. We all recognize his courage and his defeat of Goliath. We're well aware of his musical and his poetic talent as displayed in the Psalms. We also understand that he was very, very merciful to King Saul, even when the Lord gave him opportunities to kill the king. And also one thing that maybe you, maybe you knew this, maybe you did not, but David was responsible for establishing Jerusalem as the center of worship and the capital for the Israelite people. And so there are some pretty momentous things that David did. And while we celebrate David and we know that, that there is passages, there are scriptures that say that David is a man after God's own heart. And certainly there are things about David's life that we need, need to mimic and honor. There are also things. There is stuff. <laughs> and for those that giggle and you know what I'm talking about, there's another side to David that we're gonna to have to take a look at because it would be really easy for me as a pastor to preach the easy stuff and not talk about the hard stuff. So today my sermon to you is entitled David, the Unwise King. So if you would, grab your Bible and open it to 2 Samuel chapter 18 and if you would kind of keep your finger there, we're gonna be moving back and forth into some of the scriptures today but this morning, I'm going to start at the end of the story, and then we're going to backtrack until we get to this point again. Second Samuel chapter 18, I'll begin reading in verse 24. While David was sitting between the inner and the outer gates of the town, the watchman climbed to the roof of the gateway by the wall. And as he looked, he saw a lone man down uh, running toward them. He shouted the news down to David, and the king replied, if he is alone, then he has news. Skipping to verse 31. Then the man from Ethiopia arrived and said, I have good news for my lord the king. Today the Lord has rescued you from all of those who rebel against you. What about the young Absalom? The king demanded, is he all right? The Ethiopian replied, may all of your enemies, my Lord the king, both now and in the future, share the fate of that young man. And the king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room where over the gateway and he burst into tears. And as he went, he cried, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Galatians chapter six and verse seven. Do not be deceived. 
God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to his flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will also reap eternal life. You see, in life, there are two primary ways to handle problems. One way is corrective. Corrective means that you counteract something harmful after it has happened. A beautiful passage of scripture that illustrates the corrective nature of the Lord inside our lives is 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and will cleanse us, purify us from all unrighteousness. If you are thankful for 1 John 1, 9, say amen. Amen. 1 John 1, 9 is corrective in the sense that this happens after the failure, after the sin. The first way to solve a problem is to correct it after it happened, but the better way to solve a problem is what we would call preventive. You get ahead of it. You stop something before it happens. So now Romans chapter six is a classic passage about a preventive scripture. Romans chapter six and verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Yes, David did act righteously in many, many parts of his lives, but there was a window of time when he definitely sowed to his flesh. I think we all know the story that I'm about to reference, but David has now become the king. The problem with being the king is that you have all power. And power does something to people, right? It can corrupt them if their hearts are not absolutely right. And David thought that he could do whatever he wanted with whoever he wanted. So in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read of David's affair with Bathsheba. The Bible talks, tells us the story in vivid detail. When all of the other kings had gone out to battle with their warriors, David stayed at home Walking on the roof one, uh, one evening, he looks down and he sees what the Bible calls an unusually attractive woman bathing on her rooftop. David sends for her, he sleeps with her, and that begins an absolute domino effect, a domino effect in David's life. Bathsheba gets pregnant. David sends Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, who is a very faithful warrior, sends him out to the front lines and commands the rest of the army to pull back, leaving him completely exposed and therefore killed. So not only is David now an adulterer, David is now a what? A murderer. It's not going well for the king. Second Samuel chapter 12, months later, Nathan the prophet comes to David and he confronts him about his sin, and David genuinely and with heartfelt repentance does confess, and he does repent. And at the same time, David mourns and is brokenhearted when he hears the news that the baby born, baby uh, in uh, Bathsheba, as the child was born, the child died. We are grateful for David's repentance but it does not remove consequences. Grace is wonderful. Grace is beautiful. Grace is healing. And I, I thank God for his grace for all of us, but grace does not change consequences. Grace is corrective, not preventive. Second Samuel chapter 13, David has multiple wives 
is there any reason why we don't do that today? All right, it, God, in, in, in all these situations, we look at the men of God and, and those that do practice polygamy kind of point back to David and some of the others and go, well, they did it, but you look at it and go, but look how bad it went. Yeah, they did, but man, it just messed everything up. And plus, Carla would kill me. She might be watching the sermon this morning. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> uh, she, Carla, is up spending time with our daughter today. Many of you know that uh, Caroline is about within the last window of the month of uh, giving birth to their baby. And her husband had to be out of town for a few days for work. And so Carla decided, we decided for Carla to go spend some time with her. Just so she wasn't alone during this time period. So that's where she is this morning. So David had multiple wives, multiple children through these wives. And so through one of his wives, he had two children. The two children were named Absalom, that was a guy, and Tamar, that was his sister. And by a different son, or excuse me, by a different wife, he had another son named Amnon. Now we see Amnon, as you read through the stories of 2 Samuel 13, we see Amnon beginning to lust heavily after his half-sister, and he eventually rapes her. And so now this has gone catastrophically wrong for David. And we get back into 2 Samuel chapter 13, and it says these words. Chapter 13 and verse 21. When David heard what had happened, he was very angry. Probably all the dads and all the moms in the rooms would be very angry but David did nothing about it. He didn't say anything to Amnon. We don't know if he ever went to Tamar to console her. There's no record of David stepping in and doing anything. He just tried to sweep it under the rug. You cannot sweep destructive behavior under the rug. It will kill you. It will kill you physically. It will kill your spiritual life. It will kill all of your relationships. You cannot simply sweep stuff under the rug. But that's what David did. He just chose to lift it up and whew, hoping, hoping that it would just go away. We continue the story in the next verse. And though Absalom never spoke to Amnon about this, he hated Amnon deeply because of what he had done to his sister. So now, two years goes by, and this seething hatred is inside of Absalom. And unbeknownst to their father, David, Absalom uh, creates a plan to have Amnon killed. Verse 28, Absalom had invited people to his home for a feast. Absalom told his men, wait until Amnon gets drunk, then at my signal, kill him. Don't be afraid, I'm the one who has given the command, take courage and do it. And so, at Absalom's signal, they murdered Amnon. David has had an affair. David has killed someone. The child has died. His, da his, his daughter has been raped. His half son, or his son, has killed his other son. It seems like life has gone completely off the rails for David, yet he still decided to do nothing. When all of this is still going on, David just tries to keep marching on as if nothing has ever happened. And we come to verse 37 in chapter 13, and it says, and David mourned many days for his son Amnon. 
Absalom fled to his grandfather, Talmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. He stayed there in Geshur for three years, and King David, now reconciled to Amnon's death, longed to be reunited with his son, Absalom. So now there has been a period of time of five years where David has been estranged from Absalom. The two years right after uh, Amnon uh, raped his sister, he fell out of relationship with his dad then, and now three more years when he was staying with his granddad. So five years, father and son have had no relationship. But even at that moment, David did nothing. He did not go after his son Absalom. He didn't do anything to instigate a relationship with him. He had very good intentions, but your intentions will get you nowhere. You have to act on those intentions. Someone has once said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, we can want to do all kinds of things and on the other end, it'll come out and you say, but I wanted to do, I I planned to do this or that. It, It doesn't do any good at that point. When it's over, it's over. So he says these words. Someone came to the king, Joab, who was the king's right hand man who was the guy that realized something had to to happen. He took the initiative that David should have taken. So in chapter 14 and verse one, it says these words, Joab realized how much the king longed to see Absalom. And so he went to the king and he asked permission to go and return Absalom to the king. And in verse 21 of chapter 14, it says, so the king sent for Joab and told him, all right, go and bring back the young man, Absalom. Joab bowed with his face to the ground in deep respect and said, at last, I know that I have gained your approval, my lord, the king, for you have granted me this request. Then Joab went to Geshur, and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king gave this order. Listen to these words. Absalom may go to his own house, but he must never come into my presence. And so Absalom did not see the king. You feel the, the, the tension of the story? Yeah. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 14, and verse 28, it says, Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two more years. Seven years the king and his son had been estranged. Now two more years. <laughs> but he never got to see his dad. David wanted to reconcile. His heart had good intentions, but it just kept floundering just kept going on and on with this cycle of of darkness and this cycle of unrepentance and this cycle of pushing away a problem when when you know you should be doing this. And all the while, all the while, Absalom's heart is becoming colder and colder towards his father. And things are going to get even worse for both David and Absalom. And actually, Nathan the prophet predicted this in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 10. It says these words, from, the time, from this time on, your family will live by the sword. So he knew this was gonna be part of David's issue. It got so bad that Absalom rallied a large number of soldiers and they believed him over David and they began to attack David and David began to attack back. David's army was much larger than Saul's. Or not Saul's, uh, uh, Absalom's. 
And in one day when David's army attacked Absalom's army, there was 20,000 soldiers that were killed in one day. Absalom all of a sudden realizes he's not going to be able to overpower the king. And so Absalom flees. He runs. He gets on his donkey, Bible calls it a mule, and he goes riding off into the distance. And obviously Absalom had very long and flowing hair. Because the Bible says that as he was galloping on that donkey through the woods, his hair got caught in the limbs of a tree and his animal just continued moving forward. You can picture that in your mind. The soldiers see what's going on with Absalom, but they knew it was the king's son. They did not know what to do. And so they sent word to Joab. Joab comes out to where Absalom still caught in the tree, dangling from this tree by his hair. And he comes into the situation in chapter 18 and verse 14. Joab is finished with it. And he said these words in four, chapter 18, verse 14, enough of this nonsense, Joab said. And then he took three daggers, plunged them into Absalom's heart as he dangled, still alive. And in that great tree, 10 of Joab's young armor bearers then surrounded Absalom. Killed him. I wonder if the story would have ended differently if David had moved on that initiative that he felt. And even though there was a lot of darkness to uncover in that family, I just wonder, could that story have ended differently if David had stepped forward and dealt with it? And now, Now we come back to where we started. First Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway. He burst into tears and said, oh, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son. This morning, I'm going to give you five takeaways. And no, I'm not going to preach five more sermons under those takeaways. But if you're taking notes, now's the time to grab a pen and write these down. Because this is just the reality of some of the stuff that happens if we don't deal with the issues in the depths of our hearts. Here's the first thing. Pride builds walls, but humility builds bridges. There's some of us that we need to swallow our pride, need to get rid of it, and we need to handle a situation. It's in your mind. It's, it's in your heart. It's running around right now. And my prayer for all of us here, including me, including all of our leadership team here, is that, man, don't let pride, don't let pride get in the way of solving stuff. Number two, take initiative and be the first to act. You be the one to take that first step. You be the one to say, I'm gonna help bring this to a resolution. Number three, walk in the ministry of reconciliation. Second Corinthians says it like this, that since we have been reconciled to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we should walk in the ministry of reconciliation. You and I should be a part of reconciling people's relationships. Number four, never assume that there's plenty of time. We're all here today, but we're not promised tomorrow. Too many times I've had people say to me, I'll take care of it later, pastor, and later never comes for one reason or another. Then number five, deal with sin, deal with betrayal, deal with offense in its infancy. When it just starts. When you realize that this thing is going to get off the rails really quick, deal with it right then. Because it's just like what happens if you, if you don't discipline your children when they're young. 
They're going to be a nightmare when they're older. Deal with it when it's in its infancy. But right now, I'm just gonna ask that you close your eyes and bow your heads. Yeah, I know this, this one was kind of, kind of a tough message, right? Yeah. I really did not look forward to preaching this message. There's some sermons I really look forward to. This was one that I was like, oh Lord, help us all through this one. This is tough. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here in this room and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ at all. That's the foundation. That's, you do that first before anything else takes care of itself. And this is a sacred moment and thank you for just staying very still and thank you for staying very reverent during this moment. But if you're here in the building today and you say, you know, pastor, I don't, I don't know the Lord. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to today. I wanna to make it right with him today. I know I've sinned. I know I've crossed that barrier. I know I need to come back into a relationship with the Lord, but I'm, I'm just not there today, but you wanna be. If that's you this morning, I just simply want you to raise your hand right where you are. I'm not gonna embarrass you, call you out. I just wanna pray with you here in just a moment. Anybody in the room, or maybe you're watching online, if you're watching online, just let us know in the comments there and we'll reach out to you. Anybody here in the room, if you don't wanna respond by raising your hand, you can even scan that QR code right in front of you and you can let us know of that decision that you're making today. But right now, I'd like to ask everybody in the room to stand. I'd like to ask our altar team if you guys and ladies would make your way to the front. Maybe you're here in the room today and you say, you know, pastor, there was, a, there was something in that sermon that really touched me and I need someone to pray with me about some of the stuff in the message today. So in a moment, our worship team is gonna lead us into a time of worship. And this moment we craft every Sunday just to allow you to respond. This is a moment to us that says, we wanna give you time to pray because here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna hit those doors and Sunday is gonna get busy and Monday starts the work week all over again and life is gonna move on. But I'm praying right now that we would simply still our hearts. We would still our hearts in this moment. And so if there's anything about this subject matter or anything else that you need to pray about, these ladies and gentlemen are here to pray with you today. So right now I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna worship. And when the music starts, if you need someone to pray with you, I just simply want you to step out and let them begin to pray with you. Jesus, right now, I pray that you would do what you wanna do inside of all of our hearts. I pray that you would draw us closer to you. And Lord, if it means that we need to step out and let someone pray with us to give us that strength and that encouragement that we need, so be it, Lord Jesus. Do what you need to do in all of our lives today. Father, I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Thanks again for joining us today. To connect with us and for more information about Stone Edge Church, head over to our website. And if there is anything that we can be praying with you about right there on our website, you can let us know and we'll be reaching out to you. Thanks so much again for joining us. We'll see you soon.